I want to go back to Iowa State University again mm-hmm. because this will show just how political this can be, how emotional it can be, and, uh, and, and perhaps religious discrimination elements come in and so forth. And that is Hector Avalos is a very vocal atheist, mm-hmm. opponent of, of the Christian faith, very active, uh, it seems, in the atheist uh, community. You've had a debate with him. I did. I debated him several years ago at Iowa State on the resurrection of Jesus. And when you got there, what did you find? Did you find that there was a, a lot of a, of intimidation of Christian students there, and they were glad oh. to see you come to town? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that was very clear. As a head of the religious studies department there, he has it as his goal to disabuse Christian students in his classes of their Christian faith. And he portrays himself as an ex-evangelical and a former preacher. This is all a little bit really exaggerated, frankly, when you look into his personal biography. But that's the way he likes to cast himself. And has it as his goal to basically destroy the orthodox faith of the Christian students in his classes through intimidation and ridicule and, and criticism. And the way he behaves in these debates also can be very unprofessional appealing to ad hominem attacks upon personal his attacks. yes personal yeah. attacks upon his debate opponent you did something i can't help but talk about this we'll get back to the film but you did something in that debate that i don't think you've ever done before in a, in a strategy you kind of offered a disclaimer at the beginning of the debate that mm. let's keep this debate on the up and up and hector i gotta call you on something that is you have a tendency to try to embarrass a colleague and here's an example of it and so hector let's not have any of that yes i felt very uncomfortable about doing that because it was in a sense attacking him in the debate for his methods for his modus operandi but I felt that I had to do it since I was the first speaker, and I didn't want him to pull one of these tricks on me mm-hmm. in his opening speech the way I had seen him do with a Professor Shelley in a previous debate in a very unprofessional manner. In my preparation for tonight's exchange, I watched a video of Dr. Avalos debating this same topic with Professor Rubel Shelley of Vanderbilt University. I was very disturbed by what I can only call Dr. Avalos's unprofessional conduct during that debate. The goal of academic debate is to get at the truth, not to make your opponent come away with egg on his face. But Dr. Avalos adopted several stratagems in that debate which seemed clearly designed to personally embarrass or humiliate Dr. Shelley. For example, Dr. Avalos projected a photograph of an ancient document up on the screen and turned to Dr. Shelley and asked, can you identify this manuscript? Now, since there are literally thousands of Greek New Testament manuscripts comprised of thousands of pages, such a question was plainly ridiculous. It turned out to be a page from a papyrus called P66, which is housed at the University of Dublin, Ireland. When Shelley couldn't identify the manuscript, Dr. Avalos whipped out a slide of another document and said, well, I wouldn't expect you to be able to identify every ancient document. How about this one? It turned out to be a papyrus called P75, which is housed at Cologny in Switzerland. But, of course, there was no way for Shelley to know that. Then Dr. Avalos played his trump card. But Dr. Shelley, he said, these are two of the documents you cite on page 139 of your book and you can't even identify them? What made this attempt to embarrass Dr. Shelley so egregious is that Dr. Avalos knows that unless you're a professional papyrologist working for some museum, scholars don't generally work with the original documents themselves, which are locked up in climate-controlled vaults or even with photographs of them, but with the published texts of such documents. For example, here is a text of the Greek New Testament. It's the text based upon the finest and oldest manuscripts, including P66 and P75. And at the bottom of each page, it includes all of the most important textual variants from the different manuscripts. So you don't have to, and probably never could, go look up all of the original documents. But Dr. Avalos wasn't through yet. 
The papyri shown in the photos were degraded and had pieces missing from them, as one would expect. After all, they're old. So Dr. Avalos says to Dr. Shelley, why do you say in your book that these papyri contain a complete copy of the Gospel of John when it's obvious they don't? This was pure grandstanding. To say that a document is a complete gospel doesn't mean that the manuscript is in perfect condition. One typically means that the manuscript includes the whole gospel from the beginning to the end rather than just some chapters of it. In this sense, the Bodmer papyri do contain a complete gospel of John. So Dr. Avalos was not only acting in breach of professional etiquette and trying to embarrass a colleague, but he was actually the one who was wrong, and Dr. Shelley was right. But of course, all this was lost on an untrained audience of impressionable undergraduates. Now, I say all of this simply to preempt any such strategy being employed in tonight's debate. We want to focus on the evidence, not on people. I hope, Hector, that we can agree to conduct our discussion tonight according to the rules of professional etiquette and decorum that we would exercise if we were speaking, say, at a meeting of the Society of Biblical Literature. And in that way, I think we can help to ensure a profitable discussion this evening. I'd first like to thank you for coming, but I'd like to question you on your tactics. I kept tally of the number of logical fallacies you committed, and it was 25, the highlights of which were four occurrences of shifting the burden of proof, three occurrences of argumentum ad populi, and I'll skip over all the others to get to the highlight. Within 60 seconds of standing at the podium, you committed argumentum ad hominem the equivalent of a five-year-old calling names. Shame on you. All right. Shame on you. Yeah, shame on me. (laughs) Uh, I'm also a professional philosopher as well as a New Testament theologian. I understand logic. Well, Uh, obviously, you have no self-control. Allow the speaker to answer the question, please. Um, Shame on you. Floor. Would these, the audience please yeah, I, be quiet so the speaker can I, I don't think I committed any of these informal logical fallacies. Uh, I think all of my arguments are carefully formulated according to the canons of, of logical inference. I do want to say something, though, about the ad hominem point, because uh, I felt very uncomfortable about opening as I did, but I felt I had to do it in light of what I had seen in this earlier debate by way of preempting that happening in tonight's debate, because in front of an untrained audience of undergraduates, misimpressions can arise, and so that was why I did that. I I, I didn't like doing that, but I felt it was necessary in order that we conduct this debate according to professional rules of, of etiquette and decorum. But I don't think that was ad hominem, because I wasn't saying that what Dr. Avalos said was false. Uh, because of anything about him. That's what ad hominem means, is that you say a position is false by attacking the person, and I never suggested anything of that sort. So um, I think that the the charge is not correct. You tried to... uh, Your question's been answered. Um, He's actually continued since then to attack me on a personal basis, Kevin, that, again, is just remarkable because it isn't the way colleagues normally and behave in the academy. And what is forgotten in all of this, then, is the worth of the arguments themselves. Yeah. The yeah. arguments get left behind in the attacks upon the credibility of your opponent. I bring all this up to say, lo and behold, this movie interviews Hector Avalos. Yes, it does. And uh, Professor Gonzalez. And it didn't surprise me, in light of everything that you just said, that there was an instance of this kind of possible discrimination coming out of that university. And uh, Hector Avalos seemed to be very outspoken about it. Yes, that was the interesting thing about it in the film. Gonzalez's colleagues in the department, despite this secret email campaign, publicly said this is simply about his academic credentials, not intelligent design, when in fact, secretly, that was clearly the issue. But Avalos... I suppose not being part of that 
department. He was very overt that this was about intelligent design and said as much in the interview. At least the top guns at Iowa State were willing to own up to their actions. What we wanted to stop is uh, the use of the name of ISU to validate intelligent design elsewhere. And we did succeed.